Uh, my name is Peter. I'm the chair of Cork Astronomy Club, and you're all extremely welcome to this, which is our monthly lecture meeting. We'll be hearing from Killian, Killian O'Driscoll, who will give the centerpiece of tonight's meeting, which is a lecture on uh, navigational satellites. Uh, Killian um, uh, has worked for uh, the European Commission and also for the European Space Agency. He'll explain the distinction, by the way, in a few minutes, so I won't bother with that. Uh, but he's worked for both those bodies on the Galileo project, which is a European satellite navigation system. Uh, he will explain both the concept of satellite navigation and he will also explain the concept of European. So uh, all that is coming to us. So, Killian, uh, the floor is yours. Please tell us about uh, how satellites revolutionised how we navigate and tell the time. Killian O'Driscoll. Um, so yes, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself, if I can figure out, oh, there we go. So uh, my name is Killian O'Driscoll. As Peter said, I'm from Kenmare in County Kerry. Uh, I actually have a PhD from UCC. So if we were giving our talk in UCC, we'd be able to see from my old office, probably from the civil engineering building where I think these, these talks are held. But I've been working, I'm glad, in some ways I'm glad this talk was postponed because as of the 1st of October, I've been working 20 years in, in GNSS, which is Global Navigation Satellite Systems, which I want to talk about today. Um, I spent four years in the University of Calgary in Canada working in this. And then as Peter mentioned, I already spent three years working for the European Commission. Um, first in Italy, which was very nice, in a research center that the European Commission had there, and then in Brussels. And during that time, I was working on Europe's satellite navigation program, the Galileo program. So just to be clear that I, I, I did work with the Commission, but since 2013, I've been working independently, uh, sometimes with the Commission, sometimes with European Space Agencies and other bodies, but I don't officially represent Galileo in any way. Um, I just also had a, a nice uh, few years from 2014 to 2017 working at the Infant Centre in UCC, which is also a fantastic research centre here in Cork, uh, working with um, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, and just to highlight them because they were very good to me in those years. Okay, so the whole point uh, of this talk is to answer the question, where am I, and how satellites uh, sending signals from space can help us to answer that question. This is, I suppose, the first step in answering that. We are currently on planet Earth. That's in some applications, probably enough information, or in Ireland, or more importantly, probably in Cork. And further again, if we want to express this in more detail, we end up giving our coordinates like this, which is what your, your GPS gives you. Although uh, when we're dealing with people, we would be more inclined to say something like, you know, I'm outside Penny's and Patrick Street entrance, rather than I'm at 51 degrees, 53 minutes and 52 uh, seconds north, etc. But the important thing is here that in order to give our position, we need these three quantities because we're trying to determine our position in three-dimensional space. And we have two common ways of doing that. We have a system of coordinates like this, X, Y, and Z. Uh, these are called Cartesian coordinates after Rene Descartes. And I always like to look at these ones because the story about how he came up with this, I think, is quite interesting. So uh, Descartes is this French soldier and mathematician and philosopher who came up with this system of, of positioning effectively uh, coordinates based on uh, the fact that he had a, a, some class of a fever. He was, he was in a sort of a fevered state and locked in a room and looking at the corner of the room and you can look at these as being like the, where the four, where the three walls of the room meet the floor. He realized that he could describe the position anywhere in the room by how far you walk along each wall and how high up you go. And in fact, this is a coordinate system. These three numbers, X, Y, and Z, Z tell us where we are relative to this origin point. And that's what we need, a, a known point and three numbers. So we can use the Cartesian system, probably in astronomy, maybe you're more familiar also with the with a with polar system, in which case we can use two angles, uh, an azimuth angle and a, either an elevation or a, a zenith angle to give us a direction and then a distance along that direction gives us our third number. So again, three numbers. This could be latitude, longitude, height. I think if you're looking at stars, presumably you have just the two angles and you don't really care about the distance or, but the idea is that we need to know three, three quantities, X, Y, Z, or latitude, longitude, height, or theta, phi, whatever they are. And traditionally, how would we do this? I think maybe some of you will recognize this device. This is a, a sextant uh, that would be used at sea for determining one's position, for navigating. 
And the idea is that you use the sextant to determine, in this case, an elevation angle. This is one of those three things that we're trying to measure to a known star, for example, Polaris. Um, and this device allows us to take a measurement. And in addition to that measurement, we need some, some almanacs, which are information essentially that tells us at this time of year, oh, I, I should have updated this. This was from June 21st, which is when we uh, were originally supposed to have this talk. Uh, this would tell us where we could expect to find Polaris. We would then find some instructions on how to convert this angle measurement plus the knowledge from this table into, and maybe measurements to a few stars to determine our own position. Uh, in addition to this, obviously, we need to know the time. Uh, I don't know if any of you recognize this is a very nice timepiece. This is the Harrison's chronometer, which was a, the timepiece essentially invented to solve the problem of determining, one, determining one's uh, longitude on Earth. There's a very nice book by uh, Dana Sobo on that. But you can see we need to know the time, a table of information to tell us where the object is, and some measurement to that object. And this is sort of the traditional approach of how we determine where am I. We need to know our position relative to some known point. We need three components because we live in a three-dimensional world. X, Y, Z, latitude, longitude, height, or if you're looking at a map, a northing, an easting, and maybe an altitude. And how do we determine our position? Well, we need to measure some quantity relative to an object at a known location. So for example, in the previous case, that was Polaris, the North Star. We can look up the tables to tell us where Polaris should be. We measure our angles, and from that, we can work out where we are. Uh, apart from angles, we could also measure distances. If we have some mechanism to measure a distance between where we are and some known point, then we can use this information to compute our position. And in general, we nearly, generally need to know time as well, because the system that we live in is moving. The Earth is rotating, the stars appear to move. We need to know time in order to say where that object at a known location is, given the current time. That's a very brief overview of just positioning in general and, and what we need to do. Uh, but I think what we're here for really is to look at satellites and how they can help us with positioning. So I don't know if, if people recognize this image. This is from the uh, NASA database. And this is the Sputnik satellite. This was launched by the USSR, the Soviet Union, in October 1957. This is the first man-made object to orbit the Earth. It's really quite incredible that they managed to do this. It was in an elliptical orbit. That means that it's, it's at its closest point, it was 215 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. That's what they call the perigee, the that's closest to the Earth. And at apogee, it was 939 kilometers away. Uh, these wires that you see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, these are, these are antennas. So this uh, Sputnik, as it orbited the Earth, was broadcasting two tones, one at about 20 megahertz and one at about 40 megahertz. And this caused a lot of consternation actually in the US because as Sputnik passed overhead, uh, ham radio operators were able to tune in and listen to this beep, beep, beep from space, knowing that it was the, the Soviets uh, overhead. And this caused a lot of consternation. But interestingly, there were two, well, amongst all the people listening in, there were two physicists at Johns Hopkins lab in, uh, I think it's the, in Baltimore, Maryland. And what they realized was that as the satellite passes overhead, it's broadcasting at 20 megahertz. But as it passes overhead, much like an ambulance, it experiences a, a Doppler shift because there's a relative motion between the satellite and the, the listening station on the ground. And what these two physicists realized was that they could take measurements at different locations and they know where those locations are. They can use the measured Doppler to determine where the satellite is. So in, that, in this time, in October 1957, they were already able to track that satellite, Sputnik, and work out where it was in space and track it as it made its way across the United States. Now the story goes that their boss turned to them and said, we have an interesting problem from the Navy, which is they want to be able to position their, inter their submarines. So the question is, can we use this principle and turn it on its head? If, if we know where the satellite is, can we work out where our submarines are? And so they set about looking at this and the solution they came up with is known as the transit system. One of the things I find fascinating about the transit system is that the first launch of this one of these satellites, it was a failed launch, unfortunately, it, it, it didn't make it to space. But the first launch, attempted launch, was December 1959. So this is a little bit over two years after Sputnik. So I think that's incredible that they went from the Russians have launched Sputnik, we're listening to it, can we do positioning to launching a satellite in, in two years? That, that, that's, that pace just doesn't happen at all anymore, it takes too long. Uh, 
Uh, but after, by 1964, they had four operational satellites. So again, only seven years later. And if we go back to our original idea of positioning, in this case, the satellites are taking the place of Polaris in terms of our measuring something at a known location. And rather than measuring angles using sextant, we're measuring the Doppler frequency. So we're measuring how much the frequency has changed from, from what we know is, is transmitted. And as I said a minute ago, this is developed for locating their nuclear submarines. So it's, it's always interesting to see how much technological development occurs when people are trying to destroy one another. Uh, well, some of the interesting features of this was it took five to 10 minutes to get a fix, but it could be a number of hours between fixes. And this system really isn't great for aircraft. So for submarines, it was absolutely fine. So during the 1960s, again, the military were very interested in this stuff. So the, there were two competing programs from the US Navy and from the US Air Force. And what I think is really fascinating these days with the internet is you can just go online and search for these documents, which were once upon a time highly classified. I think somewhere here, unauthorized disclosure subject to criminal sanctions in 1973, but now you can just download it and read it in the comfort of your own home. Um, but this report in particular, this, this one is the Timation System, which was a follow-on to transit developed by the, by the Navy and had some really interesting technology. Uh, but this was a study over here uh, funded by the Air, the, the, the Air Force and the Aerospace Corporation. And this was prepared by two individuals, Woodford and Nakamura. And this is a very famous report published in 1966 that really outlines how we can do navigation by satellite. Um, so in this study, and I actually, again, you can download this online, and I just love the, the graphics from 19, the 1960s. I think it's a really, it's a beautiful report, well worth downloading if you can get your hands on it. Um, but they looked at the, the different ways, the different types of measurements that we can take from, from satellites. And again, if we look back at what we were doing with Polaris, one of the things we can do is measure angles, measure, measure uh, the angular, the, the elevation of the satellite. Now, what they say here is that this is low accuracy. And the reason for that actually is because what we're looking at is transmitting radio frequency waves. Uh, when, we, when we take a measurement to Polaris, to, to any of the stars, we're actually able to get very, very fine angular resolution because the information coming from there is light waves and light waves have wavelengths of hundreds of nanometers. Whereas radio waves, you're talking centimeters to meters to tens of meters and the angular resolution is very poor. Uh, the other way that they discussed is this range rate. So range is another word for the distance. So the, the range to the satellite is the distance to the satellite. And the range rate is effectively the Doppler uh, to the satellite. And looking at this, what they found was that in fact, here the position accuracy is, depends on the user velocity, which wasn't a problem for the, the, the submarines because they tended to park uh, to, to surface and stay still to get their position. Whereas the satellites are traveling quite fast. I'm sorry, the aircraft are traveling fast. It's, it's difficult for them to use this technique. So the final way that they, or technique that they looked at was ranging, which means measuring distances to multiple satellites and determining your position in that way. And this, this slide I think is interesting. This from, from that report, this captures all the different ways that you can, you can measure distance using radio waves. And so they came up with essentially four different approaches, two way transfer where you send information to the satellite and get information back or one way where you just receive information from the satellite. And then computation done by the user. In other words, I can compute my own position or computation performed by the ground station where there's some ground station that computes everybody's position. And the reason why these are interesting was, well, certainly in the 1960s, if you want to compute your position, you need a computer. And back then computers were very, very expensive. So what they've done here is they've done a very nice little graphic where they've drawn boxes and they say the user needs a receiver, a transmitter, either a crystal clock or an atomic clock. Now the difference between those is a crystal clock is very cheap and an atomic clock is very, very expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So what we can see here is these different approaches, some need crystal clocks, crystal or atomic clocks, crystal clocks, and so on. So the decisions to be made here are around how much money do you think the user is willing to spend and how is it, uh, how, how do you need an atomic oscillator or do, can you get away without having a computer at the receiver side? Um, but I think it's very interesting that this report in 1966 captured a lot of this information that we, we still use today. So at this time in the mid 60s, we had these competing schemes between the Air Force and the, the, the Navy, and again, all very much military focused. But in 1973, uh, there's a, uh, now, I'm not a historian and there's some debate about what happened exactly. 
But there was a very famous meeting anyway, called the Lonely Halls meeting at the Pentagon in September of 1973. And it's called Lonely Halls because it was held over the, the Labor Day, which is a bank holiday weekend in the US, weekend of, in, in September 73. And they brought together people from the Navy, the Army and the Air Force to come up with a joint program for navigating by satellite. And they settled on, out of all these possibilities, this idea of one-way ranging where the user computes the position. And they called their system NAVSTAR, which stands for Navigation by Satellite Tracking and Ranging. And its full title was NAVSTAR GPS, or the NAVSTAR Global Positioning System. And today we just call it GPS. And in fact, today we generally talk, say GPS, or lots of people say GPS, when they mean something more general, which we would call GNSS, or Global Navigation Satellite Systems. So the Americans developed GPS, later the Russians developed GLONASS, much later the EU developed Galileo, and the Chinese have their own system called Beidou. And each of these is a global network of satellites, a constellation of satellites providing navigation to users on the ground. So that's a little bit of history, which I always think is kind of interesting to see how we got where we are today. But the question then is, how, how does this work? How do we actually determine our position from a satellite, from a satellite constellation? And the idea goes back to what I showed earlier in general, and that we need to know where we are, roughly what time it is. So we can picture a satellite. There's actually a picture of one of the Galileo satellites. And it has information that says it knows what time it is. In fact, these satellites have very precise atomic clocks. In fact, I'm not sure if it's still true, but when they were launched, the Galileo satellites had the most uh, stable, best performing clocks ever flown in space. And I think it's probably still true. Uh, so it knows exactly what time it is and it knows where it is. And we'll see how it knows that in, in a few minutes. So it takes these two pieces or four pieces of information, X, Y, and Z, and the time. It encodes that and transmits it through radio waves down to the Earth, where it's received by us. And in fact, the interesting thing to see here is that that satellite isn't quite directing that to me, although it looks like it here. It's spreading it over one third of the surface of the Earth, effectively. So anyone can pick this up. And when we receive the signal down here in Cork, we, re we have a look at our own clock. And we say, ah, the time is now 2034.5207. So that's seven one hundredths of a second after the time on the satellite. So we know the satellite is seven one hundredths of a second away. And we can multiply that 0 0.07 times the speed of light, which is 299,792,458 meters per second, which puts the satellite at just under 21,000 kilometers away. So that's, that's the other thing to take away from this. The satellites are a long way away. That's 20,000 kilometers, not, not quite M74 or other messy objects far away, but, but, but pretty far away. Um, so what does that tell us? Well, what that tells us is knowing where the satellite is and knowing that we are tw nearly 21,000 kilometers away, we know that we're on the surface of the sphere. Okay, so that puts us, constrains us in space to be somewhere on the surface of the sphere. Every point on the surface of this sphere is 20,000, 20,985,427 kilometers from this point, the center of the transmitting antenna. So what do we do next? We need another satellite. We get, again, the satellite tells us where it is. It tells us what time it was when it transmitted the signal. Again, we take a measurement. In fact, what we usually do is we take all our measurements to all the satellites at the same time. And this satellite is only 600 of a second away, which means it's that bit closer. It's only 17 million meters or nearly 18,000 kilometers away. And what's nice about this, that, that gives us another constraint. Now we know we're on the surface of another sphere, this time centered at this satellite and the sphere has this radius. So what we would expect is that our position then is somewhere along the intersection of those two spheres. But when we plug those two things, we see something unfortunate happen. Uh, the two spheres don't intersect. And you know, this, this, is, this is unfortunate. <laughs> we know we're somewhere on this sphere, and we know that we are also somewhere on this sphere, but, but in fact, they don't touch, so it's not physically possible for us to be on the surface of those two spheres. And what has happened here is that while the satellites have these very, very expensive atomic clocks, we do not. We have a very cheap clock. In fact, you know, this is, this is my GPS receiver. The clock on this probably costs less than a dollar. Um, and, you know, those of you who have microwave ovens and, and phones and watches and, and anything that tells the time, if you look at any two or three of those, no two will agree on what time it is. And it's the same, same for our receivers. Our clock is wrong. We do not have an atomic clock. So in our case, the clock is a bit early because those, those spheres haven't intersected. The real time must be later by definition so that the spheres can intersect. 
so what we need to do is add a new unknown. We, we, we don't know where we are X, we don't know where we are in the Z dimension, we don't know where we are in the Y dimension, and we don't know where we are in time. So we need to add a new dimension. So for example, let's say this is our original uh, situation. Let's say we add one millisecond to our clock. So time is actually one millisecond later. Now we have a, now, now our spheres intersect. So we know that we must be somewhere along here. Unfortunately, we could also be two milliseconds later, which means that we're in a completely different area in space and three milliseconds later and so on. So the solution is that we need to measure our distance, our range to four satellites. And that the way to look at this, for those of you who remember your mathematics, we have four unknowns, X, Y, Z, and T, our time. And therefore we need four equations so that we can solve for those unknowns. And each measurement that we take is another equation. And if you go back uh, to the uh, Nakamura and Woodford report of 1966, this is the solution that they came up with. And they even write it here, we need four satellites. And uh, this means the delta, delta row, delta row, delta row, means the, the, the difference in range between three differences in range needs four satellites. And the critical thing from our point of view today is that that means the user needs a receiver, but no transmitter. So if the user is just a listener, like an FM radio receiver, you're just listening, you're not transmitting anything. We get away with a cheap clock, but we do need a computer. Now, back in the 60s, the fact that the user needed a computer was seen as a major drawback. Today, that's, that's nothing. We, we, have, we have computers in our toasters, so we don't need to worry too much about that. But the really important thing is, this system scales beautifully. Your users, you can build very cheap receivers and you can have a billion users or five users and it's the same to the system, they don't care because they're just broadcasting information out and it scales extremely well. And if we hadn't made this decision, if they hadn't made this decision back in 1973, I think GPS in particular would not have become the ubiquitous thing that it is today. The other thing to think about is that we can go back to the Doppler measurements that we looked at earlier. And in fact, these satellites are transmitting very stable frequencies. In fact, the, most of the signals that we receive today are at this frequency, just, just above one and a half gigahertz. And we know that those satellites are transmitting at that frequency. And we'll talk a little bit later about why it's a little bit off that frequency. So when we receive the signal, we can measure the frequency and we can observe a Doppler. So in this case, this one has a frequency that's three kilohertz lower than what was transmitted. And what that means is that the satellite is moving away from us. So as the satellite moves away, the frequency appears lower. And this satellite is a frequency that's a little bit higher. So this one's coming towards us. And what's useful about this is that we can again take our four measurements of four different Dopplers and using that, we can actually compute our velocity very accurately. So we don't just get our position when we don't just, we also get velocity. And in fact, even though GPS is called the global positioning system, when we're in the industry, we always refer to it as PVT. It's position, velocity, and time. Uh, and in fact, the velocity and the time are critically important components of what's being given, even if we think of it as a positioning system. And basically the concept is for position, we measure four ranges, four distances to satellites, and we can solve for our 4D position, X, Y, Z, and T. Um, for velocity, we measure four different Dopplers and we get a 4D velocity solution of our speed in the X direction, our speed in the Y direction, our speed in the Z direction, and essentially our frequency, or how, if we look at it, our clock is wrong, and the rate of change of how, how wrong that is, is what we get. So that's like saying our clock is drifting by one second per day. We'll get a measurement of that uh, using this technique. And in fact, the time and frequency um, outputs from GPS or GNSS in general are two of the most important. In fact, a huge number of applications don't care about position, only use time. It's a great way of transferring time from point to point using GPS. And to give you an idea of the accuracy that we can see, uh, with typical position, we get five to 10 meters of accuracy with, with, with satellite navigation, but we can get one centimeter per second in velocity, which is incredibly accurate velocity. In fact, if you're driving in your car, the, the speed reading from your GPS receiver is almost certainly significantly better than the, the speed reading from your, um, from your speedometer. So worth, worth knowing. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is the timing accuracy. We typically get five meters is roughly 15 nanoseconds of timing accuracy. That's, that's roughly the ballpark of the kind of time accuracy you can get from, from a well-calibrated GPS receiver. So, I mean, that's, that's incredibly tiny, tight time synchronization that you can get from that. And it opens up incredible applications. Um, and, I, you know, sometimes we get a bit blasé talking about nanoseconds. You know, a nanosecond is one billionth of a second. I mean, you know, there's 1,000 million nanoseconds in one second. And to get a, get a feel for the scale of that, 
if you were to count one billion once per second, it would take you nearly 32 years to count that. Right? But that that's a billion. A billion seconds is nearly 32 years. And there's a billion nanoseconds in one second, and we can get time to a precision of 15 nanoseconds using satellite navigation, which I think is incredible. Um, but there you go. I also want to address a common misconception that, that always crops up and always drives me nuts. The idea is that these satellites are tracking you. And in fact, it's exactly the opposite. You're tracking the satellites. The satellites are not, you, you're, you're, they're not listening to you. They don't care. They're just constantly talking. They're just constantly spitting out information. It's just like a radio tower broadcasting FM radio. You're, nobody thinks that those towers are listening to your FM receiver. In the same way, satellites are not listening to your, your GPS receivers. That would be something that would not scale very well at all. Um, so I want to address some challenges and I, that, that come. I mean, it, it looks reasonably simple, what I've shown so far, and I want to show some of the, 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 the error models that we need to account for. And I'm trying to focus on things that might be of interest to astronomers or those interested in space in general. And of course, one thing that, that people always talk about in, in, in GPS or GNSS is the impact of relativity. So in fact, you know, I have, a, I have a GPS receiver in here in my phone that is accounting for relativistic effects. It's probably the only commercial, you know, consumer device that we have that is accounting for general and special relativity. So the idea with, with general, and again, I'm not a physicist, so I, I don't fully get general relativity, but the concept is that massive objects, anything that has mass is warping space time. And the earth has quite a lot of mass. So space and time are distorted around the earth. And we look at this as being a gravity. Well, this image comes from NASA. You can see the earth is distorting space time. And what happens is that as you get away from the earth and move away from that gravitational influence, time actually moves faster. Why? I don't know. Ask Einstein, he can tell you. Time moves faster up here. So those satellites are actually, you know, 20,000 kilometers away. They're actually an appreciable distance up the gravity well. Um, the other thing the satellites do, apart from being a long way away, is they move incredibly fast. So the, the GPS satellites, the Galileo satellites, they're moving about 14,000 kilometers an hour, which is again, inconceivably fast. It's, 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 it's actually crazy. But they're going uh, so fast that the, again, the, the special relativistic effects come into play. And again, Einstein tells us that it, objects moving at high speeds, uh, time moves more slowly for those relative to, to us. So in fact, the net effect for these GPS satellites is that the, the, the reduced gravitational field causes time to run faster, the, the, the high velocity causes time to run a bit slower. The net effect is that time runs a bit faster on the satellites. And what they have to do actually is to, to tune their oscillators, their little crystal, well, the atomic oscillators on board the satellites that on the earth, the nominal frequency should be 10.23 megahertz. That's 10,230,000 oscillations per second. Um, but prior to launch, they are detuned down ever so slightly such that when they are launched and they reach their final orbit, the signals that we receive will look like they were generated from a clock at 10.23 megahertz. Um, in fact, the story goes, and I don't know how true this is, that the engineers building these satellites originally just didn't think this was real. They thought it was some crazy mathematical thing and it would never happen. So there was actually a switch internally on those satellites to switch between relativity is bunk and relativity is correct, effectively, settings. Uh, and it turns out relatively is correct, so they didn't need that switch in, in later generations of satellite. But I don't know how true that is. Uh, the interesting thing to see is this difference, if we did not account for it, it looks small, but it would lead to an accumulation of about 11 kilometers of error every day if we didn't account for it. So it's, it's, it's a very measurable effect and, and, and is taken care of. Um, the other relativistic effect that we need to account for, so this one is taken care of on the satellite. The satellites don't move in perfectly circular orbits, they actually move in slightly elliptical orbits. And that means that at certain points in the orbit, the, the, the satellite is in slightly different areas of the gravitational well, let's say. And so every receiver that's processing these GPS signals needs to account for the ellipticity of the orbit to correct for this, this relativistic effect. And again, if you don't do this, it's, it, it has an appreciable effect on your, on your position results. So everybody does this. Uh, the other effect that I think is interesting because this ties in with the upcoming talk on sunspots and so on is uh, that the, the signal from the satellite is not passing through free space entirely. There's a, there's a region of the upper atmosphere called the ionosphere. Um, and this is roughly a few hundred kilometers up to a few thousand kilometers up from the surface of the Earth. 
And in this region, the, 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 the constant stream of energy and particles from the sun effectively strips what few atoms there are in that area of their electrons. So the, every, every atom is essentially ionized. It's, it's a soup of protons and free electrons. And what that means is while it's very, it's, it's incredibly, whatever the opposite of dense, it's incredibly sparse, you're populated with particles, it's, it's quite uh, deep. And of course, free electrons interact with electromagnetic radiation, like these waves, and they cause them to slow down or to bend. Um, and what's quite, quite interesting about this is that you can use two different frequencies from the satellites. So we submit, transmit two separate frequencies. They bend by different amounts. But when we measure the two, we can subtract out the effect of the ionosphere and get an ionosphere free measurement, um, which, is, which is quite nice. The flip side of this is from a scientific perspective, a lot of people looking, studying the ionosphere actually use these signals to measure the amount of degree of ionization in the ionosphere and to monitor for storms and so on. And this is gonna be something that's very interesting because as the sun goes through its cycles, I don't know if people know this, but the sun goes through an 11 year cycle of activity where it gets very, very busy, lots of sunspots, lots of activity, lots of energy, lots of particles, lots of coronal mass ejections coming out. And as those reach the ionosphere, they can cause big bubbles of, of ionization in the atmosphere, which are highly unstable and wreak havoc with these GPS signals. As long as everything's kind of homogenous, it, it, it's fine. But if you get these instabilities, you can have uh, what they call scintillation, where the signals essentially are, are, are moving through bubbles, pockets of high density electrons. And that wreaks havoc with the signals on the ground. And the interesting thing is the last two solar cycles have really been the solar cycles of GPS and they've been quite quiet. So it'd be interesting to see what happens if we have a very active sun in the next solar cycle and, and what the impact will be on, on existing GPS receivers and GNSS receivers. The other thing that's worth stressing is that these signals are very, very, very weak. So remember, we've got a satellite that's 20,000 kilometers away. Um, it's traveling at 14,000 kilometers an hour. It's radiating energy at the Earth. It's covering one third of the surface of the Earth. And it's roughly speaking, you know, ballpark 100 watts. OK, so you know you've got a 100 watt bulb somewhere in your house. It's quite bright. It's very bright for a room. But it, I would imagine it's not particularly bright for one third of the surface of the Earth. Um, so the received signal power is, well, 10 to the minus 16 watts. That's 0.0000, 15 zeros, and then a one watt. It's incredibly weak. I mean, really incredibly weak. And with this, we get 15 nanoseconds of timing or five meters of positioning. But this is why it really does not work indoors. It doesn't work in forests and it doesn't work in tunnels because if you start reducing your signal power below 10 to the minus 16 watts, then you really can't do anything. You're, you're pushing the, bound, the boundaries of the laws of physics at that point. So it, it becomes such a ubiquitous thing. People think it should work everywhere, but the miracle really is that it works at all, not that it doesn't work you know, in, in, in your basement or wherever. Okay, that's GPS, GNSS in general. What I want to talk about now is Galileo, because Galileo is a, is a satellite navigation system that's very close to my heart. I did work within the program for a few years. I must stress that I haven't worked directly in Galileo in the program as an employee since 2013, but I do some contract work with, with the program, and I think it's fantastic. But I want to give some overview, because I think it's important for us as EU citizens to know that this is the EU satellite navigation system, which seems quite odd in some ways, why, is, why does the EU have a satellite navigation system? Um, but you can, you can go online, the beauty of the EU is all the documents are there. If you go to this website, eurolex.eu, you can find the currently enforced regulation on the space programs, the, the, the European space programs. And the motivation behind this really is to have what they call strategic autonomy. And I've highlighted this term, it crops up quite a lot in relation to these things. And the reason is that we realized in Europe in the 90s that we were very much dependent on GPS, and GPS is an American military system. And as I said, anything that involves timing or frequency synchronization, your cell phone networks, uh, financial trading, all these things, anything that needs uh, power systems, anything that needs synchronization or time, ultimately probably has a GPS unit in there somewhere. And so the political decision was made at the EU to, to develop our own uh, competency within the EU. Now this, this creates some interesting issues because really, anything space related you expect to be in a uh, European Space Agency and ESA program. And in fact, the EU does delegate a lot of activity in terms of procurement and development and research to the European Space Agency. But we have some issues here, and, and we'll get to this in a little bit as well, that, that the membership of the EU and the membership of ESA are different. There are countries that are in the EU that are not in ESA. There are countries that are in ESA that are not in the EU. And this creates some interesting 
problems. Um, the other thing to note is that it's not an optional program. Every every penny, every country that's a member of the EU is giving money to this system, and that, that includes us, of course. Um, the other thing to note is that, that external countries, what about the EU referred to as third countries, can contribute to Galileo, but at a reduced level. And this is, again, about preserving the strategic autonomy of the Union. Uh, this one I actually took out, but I'm going to skip through that because it's, it takes up too much time. The this is what what Galileo looks like basically. It's a it's a space segment, nominally 24 satellites, and the reason for 24 satellites is that guarantees that anywhere on the surface of the Earth you will always see at least four satellites. That means anywhere on the surface of the Earth you'll be able to determine your position, your velocity, and your time. The nominal arrangement is four is three planes, three three uh, three planes like this with uh, eight satellites per plane. And this is these are the satellites. You have the the solar panels where they get their energy from. This is a really interesting thing. This is an antenna array. This is where all the signals come from that we use for navigation. And this helps to direct the signal so that it only really covers the surface of the Earth. Um, this antenna is worth talking about just for a second. The Galileo satellites have a secondary payload here, which is the search a search and rescue system (SAR). So if you can you can buy beacons. If anyone's out there as a sailor, I would recommend having these. That if you get into stress, you can activate the beacon. It will broadcast on, I think it's 407 megahertz, which can be picked up by the Galileo constellation and relayed back to some ground stations where they can alert search and rescue services to come and get you. And Galileo also has a feedback mechanism where they can, the, the services, when they're coming to get you, can feed information to the satellites, which will then relay them back to you to let you know that help is on its way. And this is a very nice feature of Galileo that's not currently on any of the other systems. Um, this is an example launch. This is a, an Ariane 5 rocket uh, launching from Kourou. Uh, I'm not sure which one it is. I should have made a note of that. I apologize. But up in the fairing here, we have four satellites. One, two, three, four. You can see two of them. They're it's symmetrically arranged. So this is the satellite that we saw on the previous slide. This is the, the SAR antenna. This is the navigation antenna. They're both wrapped in tinfoil here to prevent uh, contamination. So you can see relative to the size of a person, they're, they're really not that big. They're, they're, they're quite small satellites. Like the, Certainly the GPS satellites are considerably bigger, but they, 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 they're military satellites and who knows what else they're doing. Um, apart from that, we, we, we tend to think very much about the, the space segment and that, that's the constellations of satellites and the satellites themselves. But, you know, it's really critical for how this works that we know where those satellites are. You know, satellites need to know where they are and they need to know what time it is on the satellites. We need to monitor where they are and how their clocks are going. So Galileo has this network of ground stations some of which are just listening to the satellites and relaying the information back to the control centers here at Oberfaffenhofen in Germany and in Fucino in Italy. And some are also sending information up to the satellites, sending them and telling them the information that they need to broadcast back down to Earth. And we're going to look at a couple of these. One is in Nume in the South Pacific and the other is in Kiruna in, um, in Northern Sweden. I think it's easy to tell which one's which, but you can see these, this is, this is a typical, this is a high grade, uh, survey antenna. This is part of a, a Galileo ground station. And this is a ground sensor station that's just listening to those signals, like, just like your receivers listening to those. And because we know very precisely where this is, we can then use that to model the orbits and the clocks of the satellites. We have other antennas that receive telemetry information from the satellites. So this is information that's not transmitted to users, but just for system maintenance. And then we have uplink stations that transmit the information back up to the satellites. So it's, it's quite an involved system at the moment, I think, and I, it occurs to me, I should have linked to a very, very interesting website by, uh, by Bert, and I must address that later. But anyway, um, you can, you, there are, I think, 20, up to 20 active uplink stations at the moment um, in different locations. And one of the things that's really good about Galileo is it's, it's really, really stable and accurate over the last number of years, uh, 25 centimeter ranging accuracy from the satellites. And again, I think it's it's actually mind-boggling how we can get such good performance from you know these very reasonably small satellites orbiting at twenty thousand kilometers and traveling at such high speeds. Um, I think this is a really critical thing about Galileo. Of the four currently operational global navigation satellite systems, it's the only one under civil control. So GPS is a military system. GLONASS is a Russian system. It's a military system. Beidou is a Chinese system. It's a military system. Galileo is, is a civil system operated by a civil organization, the, uh, the European Union. Um, and you know, its, it's, it's primary function is to provide an open, 
uh, service to, to civilians. And I think that's, that's a really important feature. There are also some unique services to Galileo. There's a search and rescue service that we talked about a minute ago. And there are two new services that are coming online very soon. One is a high accuracy service, uh, which will give us you know, decimeter level positioning. That means positioning, submeter positioning and authentication, uh, which is something that's becoming more important as we look at aut autonomous vehicles and things using satellite navigation signals. Uh, there's really for the, for the civil signals, the military signals are different for the civil signals. There is no authentication of those at present. Essentially, anyone can generate those signals and broadcast them. And that, that's a concern. And so what we're looking at is introducing authentication. This is some cryptographic elements into the signals so that when you receive them, you can be sure that this is from a Galileo satellite and that your, your position is good. Um, I like to think of this, and I think this is, this is just a little, little bit of history, and I think it's a fantastic thing as an early success for Galileo. Um, and, and this is only something I learned a few years ago, about three years ago. This is a very interesting plot, and you'll see it a lot in, in, in our industry. This is what's called the SA transition. So SA was selective availability. And this was, again, a GPS thing where the, the military didn't really want the civil community to have very accurate positioning. So what they did was, up until this point in time, they introduced a, 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 an error into the signals. So that the up until the, the 2nd of May 2000, at 4 o'clock in the morning UTC, a typical GPS receiver would give you somewhere between you know, 50, 60 to 100 meters of positioning accuracy. Uh, at this point in time, at 4 a.m., they switched off, I say, and they had never switched it back on. And in fact, the new satellites don't even have selective availability enabled, or so they tell us. But we see this transition from you know, 100 meters of error down to your approximately uh, three to five meters of error at this moment in time. And this was done at the behest of the, the president at the time, William J. Clinton, uh, signed into law on April 28th, 2000, that it was time to turn off the selective availability. Um, but what I find particularly interesting about this is the recently uh, declassified documents from 2018, at the, 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 I think it's from the Clinton Library, um, give the advice or some of the advice that was given to, uh, to Clinton prior to making this decision. And I particularly like this sentence at the bottom here. So uh, an SA decision, that's a selective availability decision now, may be useful to influence the Europeans who are weighing whether to pursue development of the Galileo satellite navigation capability. We hope to discourage Galileo's development. So even before Galileo really had any funding at all, it had already achieved its first success in that it gave us much more accurate GPS. Um, now, honestly, I think they would have turned this off eventually because there are ways around this. But I like to think that even, even Europe even thinking about this uh, at least had, had a hand in, in, in forcing the Americans hand in, in, in turning off the selective availability. Um, one thing that's quite interesting is that the, 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 the Americans have been excellent in supporting Galileo, but initially were very much opposed to it, very, very much opposed to it, because it's, it, it gives high accuracy positioning to everyone, including potential enemies of the US, and they have no control over it. So it's something worth bearing in mind. So, I want to say that I'm, I'm a big fan of Galileo. I think it's, 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 it's an excellent thing for Europe to have. Uh, I've certainly personally benefited hugely this. My career is, is based around this. But I think it's important to address that we've had some issues over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and the first of these that I, that, well, the first one that I want to talk about really is this, there was a launch failure. Uh, and I want to talk about this because I think it, it, it has a reasonably good outcome. So prior to, um, to, to launching on the Ariane rockets, uh, some of these satellites were launched on Soyuz, which are the, the Russian rockets. So in this case, on the 22nd of August 2014, there are two satellites in this particular launch. Um, and there was a failure in one of the upper stages of this launch vehicle. And these two satellites, unfortunately, ended up in the wrong orbit. Uh, and that was unfortunate. What they wanted was to be in this sort of blue dashed line around the Earth. And what actually happened was they ended up in this green, highly, what we call now highly elliptical orbit. It's, it's not crazy elliptical, but it's it's, it's really not what we wanted. So what you can see from this green plot is we wanted this signal to look just all over the surface of the Earth. And in fact, it's only covering a small portion. Um, and there were lots of other issues. The, this, this, uh, this orbit just didn't really fit in the information that we provide to the users. So there were a lot of, lot of issues associated with that. But I think uh, the European Space Agency in particular, and a lot, of, a lot of people put a lot of work into this, and they did a fantastic job of adjusting the orbit slowly. And you can see here 
the evolution of the orbit over time. So the, the kind of the inner orbit is the one that we didn't really want, and they were forcing this um, this perigee point further and further out by selective burns. Now, this was a very careful process because the satellites themselves have a certain amount of fuel on board in order to do orbital maneuvers and corrections. They don't really have enough to do major orbital changes. So this was a very carefully thought out and planned operation to bring it back. Now it's still not in a perfect, these two satellites are still not in perfect orbits, but they are now usable at least. And what I think is really interesting about this is that they did some very, very interesting research here because we get back to relativity. In this uh, highly elliptical orbit, the satellites were moving through quite a variety of different uh, regions of the, the gravitational well. And this gave them a great opportunity to study the impact of gravity and changing gravity on these clocks. Because these are, again, like I said, some of the most, the most stable uh, clocks ever launched. <clears throat> so a number of people uh, did this to actually push the testing of, of general relativity to, to, to the limits and, and came up with I think somewhat disappointingly for them that, that the agreement was really, really good. I think scientists always want their experiments to show disagreement so they can come up with new theories as to why that happened. But uh, they came up with a very good agreement with, with, uh, with, with the theory, which is probably a little bit disappointing. But I think it's a nice way that we were able to use this uh, situation uh, where things didn't go perfectly uh, uh, to our advantage. Unfortunately, there's still some issues with this. Uh, this is just some, some headlines from a, a, a receiver manufacturer that said once these satellites came back online, it caused some problems, unfortunately, for some receivers. Um, but that's that's an ongoing problem that they're hoping to resolve, and I'm, I'm quite hopeful for that. Um, the second problem um, is is one that that I think is very sad, and uh, the way to see this, I think, is to have a look at this. This is the this is the, the ground stations for for Galileo in 2018, and these are the ground stations in 2020. I just, if I flip back and forth between those two, what you'll see is that two ground stations disappeared and we got a new one. And the two, the new one is over here, which is quite nice. But the two that disappeared are Ascension Island and the Falkland Islands. And the reason, of course, why they are gone is because of Brexit. And this, this I think, was really bad for, for Galileo and bad for the industry. And there was a lot of press around it, but ultimately the, the, the problem here was that, that Britain left the EU, the UK left the EU, and Galileo is, is fundamentally an EU project. Um, there was seemed to be quite a lot of shock that that meant that they were out of Galileo, but I don't know how much of that was posturing. But unfortunately, it, it is unfortunate. There was a lot of excellent work done by UK companies and by uh, citizens that now find themselves outside and not able to contribute. And I don't think that's to anyone's benefit. So that, that's, I think, one unfortunate thing. Uh, another setback, um, I feel like I'm focusing on the setbacks that I really don't mean to, was, but on, Galileo had a, a six day outage, which is really unheard of in July of 2019. Uh, and this was quite an amazing thing. It just completely went offline. And it seems that there was a series of unfortunate events there where the assist ground network was being up, updated and the backups were offline and the whole thing went down. Um, now, the, 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 the commission and ESA gave some very good presentations explaining exactly what had happened and what the lessons learned were from this. And it was very good to see that actually, that it was quite an open discussion because at the time there was very little information coming out of, uh, out of the, the program as to what had happened. Uh, it, it, cre it creates a lot of uncertainty for people who want to use the system. Um, but thankfully, I think a lot of lessons have been learned from that. And hopefully this, this will not happen again. Um, one thing I think that might be interesting for people is to look at the budgets for Galileo because because ultimately as as EU citizens this is this is our money um, so I think it's interesting to look back I won't get into why there were a lot of interesting things happened in 2008 and effectively it was in 2008 that the the European Union and, and the European Commission acting on behalf of the Union took on Galileo in its entirety and I don't know if you're aware but the, the European Union works on seven-year budget recycles and every seven years there's a whole lot of negotiating about how much money is going to be spent. But uh, this agreement in the, under the, uh, the EU regulations gave 3.4 billion euros to Galileo in the period of 2007 to 2013. The next multi-annual financial framework was in from 2014 to 2021, at which point the budget more or less doubled to just over 7 billion euros. And now in 2021, we've just, we're just at the start of a new seven-year budgetary cycle, 
and the budget for Galileo and EGNOS, uh, I didn't talk about EGNOS, but it, it's another aspect of the satellite navigation program, is just over 9 billion euros. And the interesting thing here is that in 2013, we still had the UK contribution. Uh, so this is a 28 member state share, and this is a 27 member state share up to 9 billion euros. And it's worth, I think, again, as, a, as an Irish citizen thinking about how much are we contributing to this? So this is a very much a ballpark estimate, but if we have a, an EU population of 450 million, an Irish population of about 5 million, with a total budget of 9 billion, that I, I estimate that of that 9 billion over the next seven years, 100 million euros is coming out of the Irish coffers to go into Galileo. So um, the, it, it, it's a lot of money. It sounds like a lot of money. It's, it's rough, just under three euros per citizen per year, um, to put it in context, which is, Maybe still quite a lot of money, but it depends on your perspective. But what I would like to see is that we we get a good return on that investment, uh, and I, I'm trying my best. I try to get as much money as I can out of <laughs> out of this pot, um, and that's really it. So thank you very much for your attention, and and thank you very much. Thank you, Kilian. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, yes, well, we're, so we're back to the question and answer session then, and I, I think I'll take unfair advantage of. Uh, my position of host of this meeting, Killian, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the first question. When I'm using Google Maps, am I using Galileo or GPS or something else? Well, what, what's the story there? Very probably. I mean, if you're using Google Maps on your phone, um, most phones now have what they call multi-constellation receivers, which means GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, they do, uh, because it's uh, the, 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 the performance from having more satellites is, 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 is worth it. Uh, so it's, it's most likely. Once you move indoors, it's probably using Wi-Fi. It, 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 it knows where your Wi-Fi access point is roughly, and it, it says, okay, that Wi-Fi point is there. If you want to play havoc with, with Google Maps, take your Wi-Fi router and move it somewhere else. <laughs> okay, that can cause problems. Right, Paul, over to you then. Thanks, Killian. I really like, enjoyed that lecture anyway. Thank you very much for that. No problem. Uh, Brendan Types asks, uh, was the selective availability in GPS the reason that differential GPS was born? And who actually initiated differential GPS? That's, that's a good question, actually. Uh, so the second part, I don't know who initiated it, uh, differential GPS. So differential GPS is the idea is you, you, for the people who don't know, you have a GPS receiver at a fixed known location and it monitors the satellites, and then it works out that there are errors in those signals and it broadcasts those errors. So if you were nearby, you can pick up from the, the base station what those errors are and correct for them. And in fact, this corrects for a lot of errors, including the ionosphere, actually. So that, that's one of those things it corrects for. Uh, but but the, big, the big reason it was developed was selective availability. So I think even when I was talking about that, that slide, I said, I like to think that Galileo had an effect, although there are ways around it. The differential processing is the way around it. And, and in fact, there were big networks of differential GPS set up by the Coast Guard. So the, uh, I think, well, the Coast Guard in the US and the, the Commission of Irish Lights and the, and the, and the, the Lightless Authority in the UK um, set up coastal networks or chains of differential stations so that, that mariners would have uh, accurate positioning. So I don't know who initiated it, but the Coast Guards and, and, and the, the Lighthouse Authorities were very much influential in, 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 in uptake. Uh, Colm asks, I was just wondering how likely do you think Kessler syndrome is, and if likely, do you think enough is being done to prevent it? So I, I think that's a very interesting question. So for, again, for those who don't know, the Kessler syndrome is the idea that you could have a, a catastrophic chain reaction in orbit. In other words, a, a two satellites collide, they create huge amounts of, of, of debris, which then collides with other satellites and met more satellites and creates just a chain reaction and what would essentially render space inaccessible for until such a time as we develop technology to clean it up. Um, so it's a very real risk, I think. It's particularly, I think, an issue more for the low Earth orbit and the mega constellations. Um, so I don't know, I presume that they're being good citizens with these mega constellations because you get much denser. I mean, as you go out to medium Earth orbit, if you, let me step back a bit. If you look at something like Starlink, Starlink is at sub 400 kilometers, it's, it's two, 300 kilometers. So the, 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 the surface area of the sphere is much tighter at 400 kilometers compared to 20,000 kilometers. Or if you're out at a geostationary orbit, my hands are gone, um, you, you know, you're, it's 30, 40,000 kilometers. Um, 
Now, when 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 they, when when you know when I was involved with Galileo, we 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 always had to agree uh, under the auspices of organizations like the UN. The UN have an office of outer space affairs, and and under that there's a there's a group on on, on uh, the International Committee on GSS, and there the different providers make uh, assurances with respect to um, taking care of space debris. So even things like the launches, when when you launch the, the, the satellite, this, the rockets have multiple stages, um, so you you need to 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 make Assurances that those stages uh, are tracked or trackable, or preferably do something like SpaceX and land them, so that, that you're not contributing to space debris. So, I think it's it's, it's certainly a risk with the Kester syndrome. I think that that the, the 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 satellite navigation service providers are very responsible and very much aware and take great care of this. Um, but but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a potential issue. Maybe not so much at the real. Uh, John Walsh wants to ask his question, so. Work with John Walsh. Thanks, thanks, Paul. My question, um, it, it's from very earlier on. Uh, yes. Just I know what you said that uh, the um, the the ground station or the user's device so receives signals from satellites simultaneously and, pro and processes them simultaneously. And I was thinking, first of all, for four separate receivers on the one frequency. Is that not an issue? And then when I consider you can have up to sixteen channels, so that's sixteen different satellites. How how is that processing actually managed on such small devices? So that's small devices are incredibly powerful now. So in in in, in the nineteen eighties, um, people like uh, Texas Instruments developed these GPS receivers that were huge, and they had four channels, and some of them had one channel and it would just switch between the satellites. It would you know alternate between them. Now on your phone, you probably have hundreds of channels and, and the, process, the, the, the chips are so small, they're just able to keep up and manage that at, at, at low power. And are, they, and are they parallel processing them? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, yep. they're dedicated little chips, hardware chips, cost less than a dollar. They probably up, yeah. And it's yeah. just dedicated processing all these things. And in fact, even, even nowadays, you know, I mean, I would love to do a talk about this. You, you can get a little Raspberry Pi and a little RF front end and, and do the processing yourself. The Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi is more than capable of doing 20 channels in parallel mm. and, and it's a computer that costs now, 30 years. Now, is it really capable of doing 20 channels or the front end does uh, a lot of the group no, work? The, the front end, the front end literally just chucks data at you and and and, and the, 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 pie, the, the, the the PC on board will do the processing. Yeah. That, that's that's for hobbyist kind of stuff. That's yeah. not but the, but the, in, that, in that scenario, though, the front end does all the RF processing. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it just it captures a portion of the spectrum and brings yeah. it down and lets you and then you process from there. Yeah. Okay. Gary O'Brien asks, what limitations are there in using telescopes with built-in GPS? Actually, I have no idea. I mean, um, I, I, I've never used a telescope with a built-in GPS. But generally speaking, with GPS or GNSS, what you, you want to avoid, and you're probably the same with the telescope anyway, you want to just maximize your view of the sky. All the satellites are up there. If there's anything around you that's blocking the sky, whether that's a building or trees, it's going to be blocking the views of satellites and that's going to degrade your performance. And the other thing you want to avoid is being near reflectors. Uh, and, and that these radio frequencies reflectors are basically things that are like cars and buildings because that will cause reflections and you get a, a, condition, a situation known as multipath and that causes big error, potentially causes big errors in your position. So really what you want is nice big open space. And, and quiet solar day if, if possible or, or low ionospheric activity. Um, next one is from John. Thanks for a most interesting talk. Do car navigation system operators and phone companies pay for the use of Galileo? No, uh, no. And in fact, I, I did. I alluded very briefly when I showed you the, the budget from 2008. And prior to 2008, the plan for Galileo was a PPP, a public-private partnership, um, which was a very popular thing in the 2000s. I don't know if many of you remember. Um, but that fell apart because they were really, they never worked out a good business model for that. And basically the, the navigation, the, 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 the chips that manufacturers said, why would we pay for Galileo when we get GPS for free? So now you don't pay. Uh, next one is from Paul Nash. Uh, great lecture. Thanks, Colleen. I was wondering who was resp responsible for decommissioning and removing old satellites? So uh, yeah, that, that's that's a good question. At 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 the medium Earth orbit, that's the, the orbit where the satellites are, twenty thousand kilometers. Essentially, you decommission a satellite by turning it off and raising it slightly so that it's not going to collide with any other satellites, and then you just wait for the end of time. 
because you you do not put enough fuel on there. The amount of fuel required to bring it back down would be astronomical. Uh, uh, the only other way is at some point in the future, it's quite possible we will have to send spacecraft or some kind of nets to collect old satellites. Uh, right now, that's the only solution. For now, they call them graveyard orbits. You, and it's the same for your, your Astro satellites for, for television uh, or any of these, nothing you can do about that. Starlink is a bit different. Starlink is nice and low. So what happens with that eventually, it just burns up in the atmosphere. It's got sufficient drag from the atmosphere that it will get there. And that's actually their space debris management policy, as far as I know, is we have them sufficiently low that eventually they just burn up and, and come back down and you know crash into a field in Australia or something. Next one from Dee McDermott. Uh, thanks, Killian. Is there concern in the industry of threats to GN GNSS from large scale hacking in the main system to local spoofing and what is perceived as a bigger, the biggest threat? So yes, the answer is yes, very much so. Very, very much so. So, so GPS uh, it has recently, I'm trying to think how they finished their, their, their entire ground segment, what they call the operational control segment, has gone through an update in the last well, 15 years now, probably it's gone quite a bit over budget. But, but a big part of that, apart from, from there's, there's a lot of things happening there, but, but making it more resilient to cyber attack is a big part of that because the system was designed in the 70s. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's built on the assumption that only big state players can affect certain types of attack, whereas nowadays, you know, kids in the basement can do the same thing. So, so yes, and then Galileo was the same. I mean, they, Galileo was designed more in the mid 2000s, so it probably more of that kind of thing built in. And it's also going through through upgrades. Uh, that's on the large scale hacking side. Uh, spoofing is very much a concern, and that's why Galileo is looking at putting in this uh, authentication services. And that means injecting cryptographic elements into the signal. So you remember that those signals coming down from the satellites and they encode what satellite is and what time it is. Right now, you can go to the website. There's a GSC, Galileo Services Center website. You can download the spec for that signal. And if you've got the equipment, you can generate a signal that looks just like it and spoof. Um, and that's become so cheap and easy, which what would again once have been considered the domain of state actors is now something that people can do quite cheaply. So yes, that, that's considered to be a, a big threat. I think the, what the, the biggest concern is around motivation, right? So if you're dealing with spoofing as, as a kind of a, a hacker type thing, it's going to be over local areas, not so much. But if you, if you can affect an attack that has some major impact, whether that's a financial gain for yourself or some major loss for someone else, then, then that becomes a real concern. And, and there's an issue around vulnerabilities of satellite navigation for things like automated vehicles. So, I mean, if you can bring a drone down or cause an automated vehicle to crash or, or take control of it in some way, that's, that's a serious concern. So the issue comes around about the motivation for the attack. Um, and we're trying to, I think, head, head that sort of stuff off at the best if possible. Bill Kavanagh ask, asked, is Galileo fully officially operational? Galileo is not fully operational yet. It is in what is called an initial operating capability phase. Um, and it should be, they're going to launch actually two more satellites. I think it's two, uh, there was an announcement recently, they've just arrived. They launched from Kourou, which is the European agency, well, spaceport that they use is actually, I think, a Canis, a French space agency port in um, French Guiana. And they're going to launch two more satellites, probably, I think, in November. That will bring the total number of satellites up to 28 in orbit. Um, we have one satellite that's out of action, and then we have the two that are in the, 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 the incorrect orbits. So you need at least 24 for full operational capability. So I hope to, that they will have full operational capability sometime next year, uh, which would be fantastic. Uh, John Walsh is back with, given the number of services, wouldn't hacking, re hacking one really be defeated by the existence of the others? Well, that's, that's, um, that's part of the hope, but the, 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 in some ways, hacking multiple or spoofing multiple is not that much more difficult than spoofing just one system. Um, it is more difficult, but it's not like orders of magnitude more difficult. <laughs> um, Gillian, I, I was I was amused to find out that the U.S. government wanted initially to discourage Galileo, seemed very keen to discourage it, mm -hmm. and you showed us how 
I, I think you said the year was 2004, but I might have got that wrong. Uh, up to that time, they introduced a deliberate margin of error of 100 meters. And they then turned that off. And um, they, am I right in thinking that the reason that they wanted to discourage Galileo was because they wanted to reserve to themselves the right to introduce as much error as they wanted in the future? Yeah, kind of military situation, and that they didn't want the Europeans coming and giving positional information away free. Is that the gist of it? That's the assumption, right? I mean, they, they didn't tell me exactly what their reasoning was, um, but 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 by you know interpolation or extrapolation, effectively, they it's a military system. Okay, GPS is a military system. It has a, 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 a signal that the military you used to use at least for initializing. And that's the signal that they allow the, the, the civilians to use. But their military operational requirements would be that they can preserve their military signal while denying it somehow the civil signal um, through whatever means. And you know, having a, a whole separate civil system out there um, maybe would interfere with their operational requirements in some way, that's it. David Livingston asks, will the Ascension Island and Falkland stations be re relocated or is the cost an issue? The cost. Cost an issue, sorry. Cost. Um, so they, they, are, they are building more stations in more places. Uh, as far as I know, they have completely dismantled those two stations and they are now gone. Uh, that would be my understanding. I'm not entirely sure. Again, I think it's sad. We have a number of stations on Norwegian soil, for example, in Antarctica, in Jan Mayen, and in Neutrons, I think. So there's at least three. And, and the EU has lots of agreements with Norway, which is not an EU member state, on access to Galileo and using the ground stations and things. So it's certainly possible, and I'd love to see it in the future, uh, that, that the UK come back in to a certain extent in Galileo and kind of talk about Brexit. Um, but for now, that's just not politically anywhere near a reality. Right. Well, well, we'll definitely call that the end of the questions, uh, Killian. You sure. can uh, you can consider yourself as having done your duty now. Um, I, <laughs> well, I, I was about to say that the, the, there are numerous there are numerous comments in the chat, um, uh, thanking you and uh, praising you for uh, being an expert who's clearly on top of the subject. And I'd like to thank you for coming. And I'd like to particularly thank Linda for having introduced you to us. Because Lin, Lin, Linda's judgment, I remember her contacting me when she was uh, uh, she was still secretary of the club uh, about probably probably about nine or ten months ago now, um, and she said she found an expert on satellite navigation, and it turns out uh, that she was not exaggerating. She had <laughs> indeed found an expert on satellite navigation, and we're extremely indebted to you, and uh, we're very grateful for you joining us. Thanks very much, Killian. Thank you. And, and thank you, Linda, as well. I remember did it to you all. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs>